Testing, testing. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Tim Kent. Okay. And that's my wife, Lori. All right back there. Wave, Lori. And uh, we want to thank, I want to thank you all for having this opportunity just to talk with you. Matthew asked me to speak about some of our fossil collecting over the last 30 plus years that Lori and I uh, have known each other, uh, even back when we were dating. Okay. Before we got married, we were fossil collecting. We, just so you know, Laurie and I are recent. Uh, we just joined the Fossil Club here in NHSM this past November. So we're new members pretty much. We haven't met too many of you yet, as been here a few times already. Uh, but uh, we actually live here in Perry Hall, but just like five miles down the road. But we didn't even know until not too long ago that uh, there was a Fossil Club here. But once we found out, we decided to come here and check it out. So we're new members, so bear with Bear with us. Do we? Uh, I'm sure some of you are veterans from here long, for, for a long time. But uh, anyway, I want to let you know that uh, we're going to have some fun tonight because, uh, I, as, as Matthew mentioned, I'm, I'm a former elementary school teacher for, in, for Baltimore County Public Schools, and I used to teach the Star Lab. I'll talk about that in a minute, just a little bit as an introduction. But uh, you know how it is when you're de uh, teaching I was teaching astronomy to kids pre-K through fifth grade. You got to keep them entertained, okay? So we're going to have some fun. If I throw a sh I'm, I'm going to warn you now, I might throw a few uh, lame fossil jokes in here. So be ready for that. Be warned because they're lame, okay? In fact, we'll start with one right off the bat so you know what I'm talking about. Here it is. Did you hear about the paleontologist that just went to the hospital? He discovered a dinosaur. That's how they, I told you, they don't get any better, believe me. Okay, I just thought I'd start off with that. So we're gonna, anyway. Anyway, so tonight though, I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of my favorite areas to collect fossils in, and it's the Mantango Formation. Uh, and uh, Laurie and I have been hunting, like I said, over 30 some years in this formation. And so we're going to kind of describe it with you. I got a lot of pictures. For those of you that are on Zoom, uh, you know, we have the fossils for you to see over here on the table, some of the ones we brought in afterwards. But some of these same fossils that are over there will also be pictured up here, okay, on the screen for those that are on Zoom tonight. So anyway, so let's get started. Um, let's see if I do this right. This is going to be our challenge. And this has always been the challenge for Laurie and I since we live here in Perry Hall. You know, when you're hunting for fossil sites to collect that, you have to take into consideration how far it takes to drive to them, okay? So we, our, our goal was to find a fossil lift for us collecting locale that produces fossils within a maximum distance drive time of three hours. Because you figure you got to drive home two, three hours as well. So you want to have time to collect. So if you go, you could go up and down the East Coast, but you want to have time to have some fun not spend all your time driving. So that's gonna be our challenge tonight. And I'm gonna be showing you a couple spots uh, at the end, uh, the, one or two of our favorite spots that Laurie and I like to go to uh, that are within this three hour radius, okay? Uh, but first of all, let me say this. This was my background. As Matthew said, I've, I taught 34 years before I retired in 2020 uh, as an elementary science educator, both in Prince George's County I taught at Apple Grove Elementary there and in Baltimore County Public Schools. I worked for the science office here in Baltimore County for the last 17 years. And I, had, I, had, I was fortunate to be the Star Lab resource teacher, one of two. Uh, it, what it is, if you don't know what that is, it's a portable planetarium that I would take. It looks like a big bubble. And we'd set it up in elementary schools. And, the, uh, and in fact, here's a picture of it. That's what it looked like, okay? And I'd set it up in the gym at different schools and uh, teach the elementary kids about astronomy. So we would talk, learn about space and the solar system, 
you know, in the universe, things like that. And I'd stay in a school for about eight to 10, 10 days. Then I'd move on to another school. So I've been to every single elementary school here in Baltimore County. And the kids knew me as Captain Tim. We used to go in there and pretend that that was our spaceship and we're going to fly around space. Sometimes I'd even dress up with an astronaut's uniform and all that kind of stuff, just, you know, to, to create the atmosphere. Okay. So we had fun with that. So uh, that's, that's what I did. That was, and I got to say, that was the best one, the, the best job I ever had because I got to teach the kids fun stuff, you know, and then move on to the next school. Okay. We had a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, so also Laurie and I, we met, we met back in 19, was it 1991, dear? 91. You see, I got it right. I'm glad. Uh, we've been collecting fossils for a long, long time. We got married in 2003, but we, we actually dated for over 10 years. Okay. Uh, and during that time, during that time, we, we spent a lot of time collecting fossils. I found out she was interested in it. And so, and so was I, as a, as a matter of fact, she, uh, one of the first times we went fossil collecting was, a. Is, have any of you ever been to, it's not open anymore, but that old Swatera Gap site up there and under I-81 when it was still open. Well, I, when, one, of our, one of the first times Laurie and I da dated, we went up to that site. We'd never been there before. And that was a real steep quarry right under I-81, the interstate. And Laurie, we were looking around, we were finding a few cryptolithus trilobites. And she went up to the top, top, very top of the quarry. I said, Laurie, get down from there before you hurt yourself. She said, but that's where the fossils are. So I knew right then I, I found a winner because she had the same interest. I did. Okay. She, she wanted to get those fossils no matter what the danger, right? Anyway, uh, that, that also reminds me, uh, we were seen on our first date not only fossil collecting, but checking out, the, we were trying to figure out on our first date, all the ages of the fossils we collected. Do you know why we did that? We were carbon dating. Oh, I told you. <laughs> okay, there's another one. Anyway. Yeah, I'm sure she's, yeah, she hears them all the time. Anyway. But in other words, this is just to show you that we really love fossil collecting. We, we love to collect fossils. In fact, uh, I love fossils so much, I think I, I almost wish I could be a fossil. Then perhaps somebody would dig me, you know? Okay. Anyway, let's move on, okay? So what we're going to do tonight is look at uh, uh, five questions about the Mantango Formation. Uh, learn a little about them because this is one of my favorite areas and Laurie's one of her favorite areas to, to hunt fossils in too because of its diversity of fossils you can find a lot you never know what you're going to dig up at a Mantango site formation site and it's widespread if, if you're not familiar with it it's widespread throughout this mid-Atlantic region okay so uh, question number one we're going to talk about is this how old is the Mantango formation well, it's part of the Devonian period, which would, would date back to, it's believed, from 419 million years to 359 million years old. Now, Devonian period is named after Devon, England, okay? They found similar fossil for, uh, strata over, over in Europe. And uh, the Mantango itself would be considered Middle Devonian would be around the middle part of uh, era, would be around 375 million years old. Okay, and, and the Mantango, where they get that name, that came from a creek in Pen Perry County in Juniata County in Pennsylvania. It's called Mantango Creek. Has to be some kind of Indian name, I don't know. Okay, but that's, uh, th that's where they get that, that formation name. So, let's keep, whoops, I'm sorry, go back one. For those of you, I know a lot of you around here are used to going to uh, down to Calvert Cliffs uh, to put this into perspective. And I've been to Calvert Cliffs. I love finding any kind of fossils, no matter what the time period. But uh, look at the difference in uh, time periods that we're talking about. If you're hunting in the Miocene, the Cenozoic era, that's you know, 
between 5.3 and 23 million years old. That would be the stuff you'd find down at Calvert Cliffs. But look what we're talking about here in the Devonian, way down here, rocks that are much, much older in the Paleozoic era. Uh, and Mantango would be right about here. So we're talking about some very old marine invertebrates that you can find. And most of these are found up in the mountains, okay? Which you wouldn't think of marine organisms up there, but they were, as you'll see why in a minute. Kind of puts it in perspective how old this, these rocks really are. So here that brings us to question number two. What did the Devonian world look like? Well, I wasn't there, and neither were any of us, but uh, this during, it is believed by scientists, paleontologists, that the Devonian period had, was 85% of the world covered by oceans, by an ocean. So that's most of the world was marine. Uh, and the, your North America and Europe were connected in what was called your America. So Europe and America hadn't, North America hadn't split yet, okay? So for what, why that's important for us here in the Mid-Atlantic region, this, we were located at that time, your America was near the equator. So that means the area was a lot warmer at that time. So it would be a marine environment that was more like equator type uh, uh, animals that live, organisms lived in that climate than we experience here today. Here's a picture of what your America would have looked like right here. Okay, and I have to notice for a lot, there's, uh, we would have been right around that area. So it kind of just gives you an idea what they believe it looked like back in that, back in the Devonian period. So, now this is what they believe the life in a, this is an artist rendition here of what they believe the Aman Tango Formation uh, Devonian Reef would have looked like on the ocean floor. Notice if you, what, what jumps out at me right here is that look at the, look at the abundant variety of invertebrates you can see. You've got brachiopods, lampshells, corals, crinoids, bivalves, rhizoans, goniotites, uh, cephalopods, gastropods, and trilobites, okay, all over the place. So you, if you're hunting in the Mantango Formation, sky's the limit. You don't know what you might find when you, do, you split open a rock, especially if you get into an area like this where it's a shallow underwater reef, okay? Um, so let's keep on going here. So the question then comes up is where is the Mantango Formation exposed to where we live near here? And that, that would be within that three-hour radius I was talking about. Well, there's three areas that I, that, that I found. Uh, West Virginia, just west of I-81 in the Appalachian Range running north to south. Western Maryland on that same line, west of I-81, past Hagerstown, Maryland. And central to eastern Pennsylvania, which is particularly rich in the Mantango Formation. We'll get more specific about that sh shortly. Here's a map of West Virginia. If you look at this lavender, that's lavender, I guess, right? That where the D is, the Devonian period runs right along here, along this spine. I-81 would run about right about here. Where we like to hunt, we like to go over to Winchester and then go west from there on 50 or go down to Strasburg, Virginia. And if you go west about 20 miles, you're in West Virginia. Okay, so I-81 runs down this way. And so all along here are outcrops of the Mantango Formation. You're liable to find any, any, uh, any uh, fossils along there from that, from that Devonian period. Okay? If we look at Pennsylvania, look what we have here. Here's the Devonian uh, uh, key. See how this color runs up through central Pennsylvania? And then it curves around to the east. Of course, northern Pennsylvania has a lot of Mantango as well. It even runs up into New York, okay, the Mantango Formation. But if you notice, they named that, that Mantango Creek is uh, Perry County, Juniata County. That's right here. Here's Perry County. There's Juniata. Right in through here is there are a lot of outcrops, like borrow pits, outcrops, 
road cuts, whatever, that have Mantango formation sites. And you just got to look for them. Now, those of you that have hunted up, any of you hunted up by Centralia, uh, Centralia, that's over here in, in this area. Some of these areas near Schuylkill County, that's this, that's over here, that's Pennsylvania period. That's that direction. So you see, but just to the west of that, it's a lot of Devonian, Devonian area in Pennsylvania. Okay. Now, question number four. What types of fossils can be found in the Mantango Formation? Well, as I said before, there's a wide variety of fossil fauna in the Mantango. And because, because it's, it represents, they think at that time, a shallow water marine environment. Fairly shallow, maybe less than 20 feet in most places, not very deep. Okay, so it was an underwater reef habitat. So when we go hunt some of these spots, if you dig down in certain layers, you can find slabs of rocks with all kinds of fossils on them. Okay, all different varieties, things you just see on an underwater reef, like we saw that picture earlier. But by far the most prolific fossil type in the Mantango are called brachiopods, which are otherwise known as lamp shells. And the one we like to look for when we check out a new site road cut up there is we like to hunt for the what's called the mucrospirifer, which it looks like this one right here. Larry says it looks like bat wings, okay, on the side. Okay, these are very common in the Mantango formation, and they're also considered an index fossil of that of the Mantango. So if you start finding these, pretty good bet you're in the, you're definitely Devonian. And in the in the Mantango formation, when you find these fossils here. Here are some examples of brachiopods found in the Mantango formation. As you can see, these are all ones we Laurie and I found together. Uh, here's some mucrospirifers. This is called a spinocertia uh, granulosa fossil. Some of those got about can get this big, okay? I like them because they have these beaks on the front, you know, the, the pedicle where they attach the, the marine floor, the, the ocean floor. Those are really cool when you find those. Um, we also find lots of bivalves, um, mollusks. This one here is an internal, you see a lot of internal molds. Here's one that has the pedicle which attached to the sea bottom right here. Uh, this one here is called. This is called an orthonata. This is pretty common at one of the sites I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. I think uh, sometimes you find both valves of these. Uh, they're, they're related to the razor clams. But uh, when, they're both, when you have both sides together, sometimes they're fanned out. And they look like, uh, oh, thanks. Thanks, Matthew. They look like, uh, I call them like butterfly shell valves, you know shells they're really pretty when you find both valves together okay very some of them have good detail you find a lot of these bivalves almost as many of those as the brachiopods when you're hunting in the mantango formation we find also gastropods and some of them like you see here are in remarkable detail i mean these are well preserved uh, you know this this is a uh, all of these you see right here and this one came from a site I'm going to be telling you about a little bit later. It's called Rio, West Virginia. Okay. And uh, all these came from a road cut there. Look at the, they're, pre they're pretty when they come out, out of the road cut. This one here came from the other site, another site I'm going to tell you about. That's from at Seven Stars, Pennsylvania. Okay. That's where I found that one. Yes, question. Yeah, anytime anyone has a question, stop me. Sometimes they're exposed. Sometimes we split them out. And I'll talk more about what tools we use in a little bit, OK? But that's good. Yeah, some, you have to do a little bit of both. And a lot of splitting the rocks here. It's not like when you're down at uh, uh, Calvert Cliffs and you find them just lying on the, on the beach, shark's teeth lying on the beach or some of those things. You, these you have to split rocks for mostly most of the time, but the shales are pretty are pretty 
most of them, the shales are not that hard. Sometimes, because most of the colors of rock you get in the Mantango, as you'll see on the table over here, are a dark brown rock or a light or a tannish color. And sometimes you'll get an olive color rock too. Those are fairly easy to split, but every once in a while you'll get into a layer that's kind of a grayish rock. Those are much harder to split. You definitely need, sometimes you need a stone chisel for those. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Good question though, here we go. Now these two I really like. This one, uh, we find, I love finding these straight shelled cephalopods. And these are kind of relatives of ancient squid, not oids. Uh, I found this one at that Rio site. Look at the internal, the segments that you can see on the inside. That's pretty big. That one's over here on the table. That was just lying down in the ditch next to the road cut when I found it. Okay. So sometimes they just fall right out and weather out of the, out of the sides of the rock. This one I found, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, uh, Deer Lake. Uh, I found this one at Deer Lake. Uh, it, you know, just, and I split a rock open to find that one. Okay. That's more, that was a little harder rock. You see how it's a kind of a grayish rock compared to this one. This one was found in West Virginia. This was found in Pennsylvania. So you get a little two, couple different rock types. Okay. But this one is in very good detail as well. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Now, we also find corals, especially internal molds of corals in the Mantango Formation. This one is called a Pleurodictium. It's a tabulate coral. Uh, and you can see this is quite common in some of the sites at the sites we go to. This is an internal mold of a coral, probably like a heterophrentus coral. That's the internal part of it. By the way, this is found. I'll put in a plug for the uh, the site we're going. Matthew just set up. Uh, did they know about that yet? Okay. Well, Matthew just sent out an email about in September. On September 8th, there's a uh, club fossil hunt. We're going to go to uh, Beltsville Dam, the Lake Spillway. I found this one there. Okay. That's where this one came from. There's a lot of that horn, horn coral, a lot of those specimens there, okay? That rock's a little harder, though, as you can see. You have to pound that rock a little harder to get those out, some of them out. And then there's a lot of bri... You see some of these. These are, these are called bryozoans. This is called fenestella, and uh, it kinda, they kind of look like... I, I always... They're like shaped like fans, you know, fan-shaped nets, a net-like structure. By the way, you see a lot of this at the Beltsville Dam uh, spillway site as well. A lot of this is around. And, it, and I, I really like these when you can get a big slab of those. You know, you get a big piece uh, with the fan like this. Pretty, they're pretty nice. Fairly common there at Beltsville. Okay? And then, of course, there's the crinoids otherwise known as sea lilies to some, found in the Mantango Formation. Now, sea lilies are not, uh, crinoids are not, are not plants, of course. They're marine animals that attach to the bottom, the ocean floor. And most of the time when you find them, and they're, very, they're pretty common in the Mantango, most of the time you find this. These are the cross sections of the, uh, of the columns, a part of the column just cut across the piece. You can see there's a lot of crinoids in this piece that got separated. What's really hard to find is this part right here. And anything related to the calyx or the, the cup of the, where they, where the branches of the, where it branched off. But uh, you will find these, these are, these, that's a nice piece of the column of a, of a crinoid right there. Uh, sometimes you can find, the biggest ones I've ever found, I've found some pieces about this big, okay? Which are nice. Or the crinoids. And then there's the, oh, the goniotites, where it's related to, uh, or really ammonites, found in the Mantango. The kind you usually find is this. Uh, this one was actually found at Deer Lake, okay? Uh, and I said, well, what's the difference between that and a gastropod? 
Well, I did a little research, and I, I think what I was told uh, on the internet when I did a little internet research was the gastropods, gastropods kind of curl outwards, okay, whereas the goniotites curl inwards, and they have usually you could see the segments on those as well, okay. That one was about this big. It was found at Deer Lake, okay? About a two-incher right there. These came from seven stars, both of them. These had to be reconstructed because they kind of wanted to fall apart. <laughs> okay, I had glue with me, thank goodness, for the, these two. Um, and here's the big prize of the, of the Mantango formation. It's called the trilobite, okay? Um, this is one I found. It's called a Green Ops Boothy trilobite. I found this at seven stars. These were found in West Virginia. This is called an enrolled fake cops reina trilobite. I believe this one here is the Pennsylvania State fossil. I believe, yes. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and it, I always think of it, it looks like a big frog's head to me, okay, when you find these. Uh, they're very detailed in some parts of the Mantango. They're usually in this rolled up position, in rolled position. But uh, they're really nice. I found, I've seen them as big. I've got one over on the table. You'll see just the back of it. It's, it's long, two inches long. They could get up to four or five inches uh, this, this tight. Um, that's the big prize in the Mantango. Everyone wants to get a trilobite, okay? or at least part of one, that's always, that's always fun to get. And that reminds me of another little joke. Have you heard about the two fossils that were eating out at a restaurant? The first fossil said to the second fossil, man, this is terrific pizza. The second fossil said, really? How good is it? First fossil said, well, here, trilobite. Oh, come on. That was a good one. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, well, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on from that. Okay. Here's a, a trilobite that Laurie found, a different species at Deer Lake. Okay. Right next to the restaurant there. Okay. If you've ever been there, there's like a restaurant and a pub and a big shale pile off to the left. And she found this as she got right out of the truck, my truck. She found it right in the rubble, okay? Uh, this is a Deplora trimeris decay uh, trilobite. And this is rolled. You see it's in an enrolled position. But I had to, it was only partially, partially uh, visible in the rock. We had to split. When I got hope and I got it home, I had to use the uh, uh, a Dremel tool uh, on it to, and chip away some of the extra rock, the matrix. And, but you notice on this one, this one has, you can see the two eyes, how it's rolled over on the head. It has this like squared off, it has a lip right here for its nose uh, and the, on the head. And here's rolled back. This is the part that was visible in the rock when she, when she found it. But that's kind of a, those can get up to, I understand, up to eight inches long. Now I, you'll see over on the table, I've got some examples. We've got some examples of, uh, and a picture of what a hole one would have looked like, because they're very difficult to find hole, because they're it can get so big. But you'll see a, a head of one that would have been part of a lawn that's at least five inches long that I found at Deer Lake. And so you'll see the two eyes if you look at it closely like that. She has this one over there too, but this was about this one was about two to three inches long if it would have been flattened out, not rolled. Okay, that's one of her favorite one of her favorites she found at, at that spot, okay? The nice thing about the Devonian period is if you're hunting in the Mantango Formation, it represented the high water mark for trilobites because in all the different types of fossils, trilobites that were, there was more fossil trilobites in the Devonian than any other period, okay? Because right at the end of the Devonian period, scientists believe they were almost all wiped out except for just a couple species, there was a mass extinction. I don't know what caused it exactly, but there, at, the, at the end of that time, almost all of them were gone. So if you get to Silurian, Mississippian, those, those different period, 
you're probably not going to find too many trilobites if that's what you're looking for. Okay, but here you here you can good chance to find one in the in the Devonian. Pretty I wouldn't say they're common, but if you diligently hunt at most of these sites, we found we found quite a few over time. They're not as common as brachiopods, though, of course. Now, that leads us to our last question. This is where can one search for Devonian Mantango formation fossils? I, there's two sites I'd like to share with you tonight that Laurie and I both have been to. Uh, and these, I, I thought about what sites we've been to, we've searched. I've done a lot of internet searching of road cuts and borrow pits and scouted out some sites myself all over Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia over the last 30 some years. But I was trying to think of what are some good ones where you're all, where you could go to within that three hour radius and pretty much be guaranteed to find some good stuff. Okay. You know, where you didn't have to search all day and just find one fossil. Okay. So the first one I want to tell you about is this one. It's in Delray, West Virginia. It's in uh, Hampshire County. I did a Google map search. It's only two hour. It's two hours and 37 minutes within the three hour radius uh, from Perry Hall since that's, I used that because that's where we live. And the second site I'm going to talk about is Seven Stars. That's in Juniata County. That's only two hours from here, from this spot, uh, kind of northwest of Harrisburg, okay? All right. That is a very good site as well. And, of course, you also have to think about when you go to these sites, you have to think about parking and all those things too because some sites are better than others. Uh, Marla, you were telling us about a site that wasn't good for parking. You had to walk down railroad tracks. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not ideal, especially if you're in a group, that wouldn't be so good. But uh, sometimes when you're a fossil hunter, we're a dangerous bunch, right? We take our lives in our hands to get those fossils, if we're really dedicated, that is. Okay? So anyway, let's talk about the first one. Now, I know you've all seen this. A lot of you have seen this book before. This is the one that Laurie and I, when we first started hunt, fossil collecting back in the 90s, we got. This was Jasper Burns' fossil collecting in the Mid-Atlantic States. Now, let me say something about this book. It was a great book and still is for certain sites, okay? But it's an older book, and it lists exact sites where you can go to. But some of them have closed. Some of them are, have changed. Some of them, even the route numbers have changed, trying to find them, uh, as we found out when we first started hunting in West Virginia. But some of them are still good. We kind of took that book when we first started dating and started checking off different sites we wanted to go to within our, our time frame. And uh, we found this one. This is one of our favorites. This one is on in that book, if you get it, have that book is locality 27. Page 112, this is just south of Delray, West Virginia, on Route 29. It's a road that's, I wouldn't say it's a heavily traveled road. It's a country road, and it's kind of, cars don't come down there very real often, but when they do come down there, they're flying, okay? So you just got to be careful when you're crossing the road. There's a, it's op, the fossil outcrop is where Route 29 intersects a little, little tiny lane road called South Lick Run. Um, but the nice thing about it, right across the out from the outcrop, there's a real wide pull off where you could pull over and park your vehicle. Just make sure you don't park in front of the at the one end of the north end of the outcrop. I mean of the parking area. There's uh, some mailboxes. You don't want to block people's mailboxes. But there's plenty of room for right you could four or five cars with no problem. Okay. And it's a you're out in the country, it's a little uh, a very scenic spot. And then if you go a further mile, now when we were there, we were last there, Laurie and I went there during COVID back in 2020. And uh, when we went there, we ran into a farmer that owns the farm about a half mile down the road. And uh, on the other side, uh, to the left, closer to the river, he said, he asked us if we were finding fossils. He said, yeah, he was a real nice guy. And he said, well, you should be hunting half mile down the, down the road because that is more of what the site talks about in the book. 
in Jasper Burns' book around that bend. And we didn't know that. We, we thought we were in the right spot up at uh, Del Rey because it was producing for us. And uh, so we went further down there. There you park. He said it's okay to park. There are people parked there all the time. Uh, but there's, there, you'll see like a pull out for maybe two cars. There, you could pull off on the other side of the road. And I'll show you pictures here in a minute of, of, of where you'll be hunting. If you hunt there, then on, when we went over there, sure enough, we started finding lots of gastropods. Uh, a lot of gastropods and that's, at, at, at that site. Uh, in fact, let me show you some pictures of what we could find. Here are some pictures of this, of this locale. This was right here is that South Lick Run Road going this way, okay? Here's Route 29. That's Route 29 as well. You see this outcrop right on the corner, right across from here is the parking area. This is a good spot. Here it is again. Now, one thing, you can find fossils lying loose down at the bottom of the outcrop, but this is where you need your chisel, okay? And, and your, if you have a chisel and a rock hammer like this one right here. Now, this is what I recommend for this site. I mean, the, the kind of rock hammer that has the point on the back will work, but this is better because this you can split the shale into layers with. So the flat end ch uh, chisel like uh, rock hammer works best for that. And then I, we found out, see, my two buddies, they went up here on the side. They climbed up here. They were finding all kinds of cephalopods, straight shelled nautiloids, and gastropods right up in here, like we saw earlier. And earlier he just, or Jim just pulled one, one out right there. And you can actually see them in the side of the rock. Trick is getting your chisel in behind them, pulling them out without breaking them. All right. But, you know, some of them fall down. We found them cleared down here at the bottom. It's a good little spot. You'll find brachiopods there as well. But that's a good spot for gastropods snails, snail fossils, right there. Uh, and now that further down the road, this is right for, this is, uh, this is uh, Larry's way down here, you can see, okay? And uh, right here, you'll see there, there are lots of these little gastropods of different species. They're over here on the table too, called Bembexia. Uh, they're like flatter, they look like, more like discs. You know, they're, they're not as pronounced. Uh, we found, I found lots, quite a few right in the side of the rock. You just had to chip them out right out of the layer. And you could park right across the road. That's a good spot to go. Uh, like I said, it's been two and a half hour drive. Any questions about that one? Okay. All right. The next one, this was the seven stars look uh, This one, is two hours from here going north, okay, instead of west. This is off a large abandoned borrow pit. Belongs to somebody, but whoever owns this has never had any issue with anybody hunting there for years. In fact, I talked to the guy that lives across from the borrow pit. There's a house across the road, and he said, he, he came over, he just asked, he said, you find the fossils over there. He said, people from Harrisburg come here all the time, some geology class comes up from one of the colleges in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and every once in a while they see a band pull up and they start looking for fossils. Well, every once in a while. Most of all, every time I've been there, I've only ever seen maybe one or most of the time I've been, Laurie and I've been by ourselves, or my friends and I have been by ourselves, and once in a while one other person might show up. There's a big area to park right there at the borrow pit. Now, if you look at these rocks, you see a lot of loose rocks at the bottom of the outcrop. Okay, now there's fossils in them, but I will say this, this site is a, a well-known site, okay? So if you wanna find the best fossils, they're in there, but you need to get below the top layer that everybody just walked around and surface hunted, okay? If you just dig down a little bit, you'll find some better stuff. I got some more pictures, look at this. Here's some friends of mine, notice we, uh, we took a crowbar and got some new slabs, okay? And we got down underneath, found lots of brachiopods underneath the main surface layer here. That's my friend, Matt. My friend Gary and his family went along. Some of the rocks are bigger here, the slabs, but over here, some of these rocks are more, I would say, what, chippy, you know? 
it, you, you want to stay away from those. Try to get down underneath those rocks because these have been weathered more. Get down. When I started digging down and clearing away a pile, brushing some way, I got into some better slabs you can get into, found some very good things. This area is known for its bivalves. Their internal molds of bivalves are very common at seven stars. Uh, now, one thing you got to watch here, the bivalves can get pretty big. But, uh, you got, but unfortunately, in a lot of these Mantango sites, the trick is finding a, one that's complete. Some of them are where the, where, they, where the cleavage of the rock, when you split them, they cut sometimes have a tendency to cut right through the fossil, you know, unless you get, but it, if you take your time, you'll find some complete specimens of, uh, that you can find in there. And like I said, I found a green ops trilobite in there. There are fake ops trilobites as well, uh, pieces. But, uh, and I've heard of some big trimeris trilobites coming out of there. I have found parts of the backs of them. I just haven't found a full, a full one in there yet. I'm still, I'll still look. But it, there are fossils are very abundant and in this. If you, if you get below the surface, you will find lots and lots of fossils. We filled up our a bucket, bucket full last time we were there. And I've been there last. I was there twice last year. Okay, last summer. Okay, any questions about that site? Yes. Oh, yeah, let me back up one. If you go to Route 235 uh, and go into Seven Stars itself, it's just a little crossroad village. It's like four corners, and that's a, there's a thrift store on the left when you come into it. When you get on 235 and head west, it's only three-quarters of a mile down the road, the borrow pit's on the right, and you can't miss it. You'll come around the curve. There it is. There's plenty of places to park right there. So I, there's like a little somebody's house on the other side of the road, but it's a big pit. So very easy to find. Just, just three, just, just west of the seven stars. Now, don't confuse this. When I first went there, I went to Google Maps to, to map this out to get there. Google Maps is great, but it gets confused sometimes. There are at least three seven stars in Pennsylvania. You don't want to go to the wrong one because there was one in Adams County, which is, I guess, over towards the Gettysburg area. You'll never find it, <laughs> the borrow pit, if you go there. Then there's one way over in eastern Pennsylvania as well. So make sure you get the seven stars that's in Juniata County, okay? Juniata County of Pennsylvania, okay? So that's a good one, good one to go to. I recommend this one highly. Okay. Now, as far as other road cuts and things, I've used this book. Uh, I mean, there's we found several good sites that are still good, you know, in in Jasper Burns's book. But I, but I also for Pennsylvania, if you want to go that direction, this is an older volume. Some of you may have seen this one called Fossil Collecting in Pennsylvania. You can't buy these new anymore because. There were two editions. One came out in 1969, and this one came out in 1983. This is the newer edition. You can only get used copies. You might, I got this, so I did get it from Amazon, but if you can find it, you know, it, it's, it's, it, if you do find one, grab it because this thing's worth its weight in gold, okay? It, it's uh, Donald M. Hoskins, H O S K I N S. Is there? Was there? Okay. Because it's, uh, and I noticed one thing. I have the original version, the 1969 version, and then I got this one. Some of the sites are different in this one. I was able to get newer sites. They changed some of the counties because they tried to, in this book, have at least one. There are 67 counties in Pennsylvania. They decided they wanted to come up with at least one good fossil site for every county. They weren't able to get a few like in Berks County over near Philadelphia. They couldn't find any over there. But some of the sites they came up with changed. They found better sites from between 69 and 83 when they did the revised version. So, you know, I ended up, was able to get a copy of both. The one I have from 69 is falling apart, okay? Because <laughs> that, that one saw a lot of use from somebody before I got it, okay? So check that out. If this one... The reason I bought this one is because in the back of Jasper Burns' book, 
he referenced that book, Fossil Collecting in Pennsylvania, and he mentioned that he had visited many of the sites in that, that book, and they were very, most of them were productive. So I said, well, I'm going to get that book because I, I like the sites that were in here. So he, uh, so he recommended this book, and I do too. I mean, some of the sites are, are gone. That was 1983. That's an older book too. But some of them really still really produce. Seven Stars is listed in that book as well, as well as other sites in that central Pennsylvania area, eastern Pennsylvania. And it even covers all, all throughout the state. If you want to explore, go on a road trip and cover all Pennsylvania, there you go. Take that book with you. Yeah, all right. So I highly recommend that book. And I do things like between those books, you know, we got the tool with an internet, Google Maps. What I really like is you, when you try to cross-reference some of those sites, some of the road names have changed too. You got to try to find them on Google Maps. But the nice thing about every once in a while, you, you hit the jackpot and you find a site where it gives you the street view on Google Maps. And you can see what it looks like without even having to drive it up there. And I've been able to see the outcrop right there on the street view. For certain, not all of them, because they're usually along some of the main roads. But they have the street view on Google Maps. That's something to check into. That's how I do my, do my uh, research for different sites. And I, I could say I've been to, like, I think it's over 30 sites in Pennsylvania, West Virginia now, just by checking them out one by one. Sometimes having to drive to, to them and find out there's, there's nothing there, or, or sometimes you hit it really nice. Okay? So here we go. One thing I will recommend if you go hunting in the Mantango Formation is this. Definitely get a rock hammer. You, you're going to need it there. You just can't, unless you're just going to pick up loose stuff off the surface. That's fine. But some of these, yeah. Some of these rocks have big slabs of things on them. You want to knock them down to size. Uh, some of the rock, as I said, is harder than others, depending on the color and uh, makeup of the rock. But I recommend the kind here with this, the flat end. Uh, and a stone chisel is recommended for splitting some of the hard, harder rocks. Most of the Mantango shales I've been to split fairly easily, and I can use it with just the back of the hammer right out in the field. Sometimes you really gotta, you gotta really hit the rock hard in certain spots, uh, but that's where the best the best fossils are in the unexposed areas. Now that's not always true because sometimes the stuff that's weathered, if you get into a spot not too many people been to, some of the weathered stuff is nice too that you can find at the talus at the bottom of the formation. But I would recommend wearing knee pads for climbing up the rocks because you will be climbing up on the slopes of these borrow pits and rock outcrops and even uh even a pair of crampons uh helps too you know you can put on your shoes i i was just i was telling marla a site i was at two weeks ago where i fell down the side of the hill uh i don't i dropped about six seven feet you know the, the rocks just came right out from under because i didn't i was wearing i just i didn't have crampons on that day <laughs> okay some of those rocks can you got to be careful when you're out there uh, on these slopes. Okay. Well, that's that's pretty much it, except for before you leave, unless anybody has some questions, before you leave, Laurie and I have a lot of uh, uh, fossils to, for you to look at that we found. Every one of the ones over on the table, we we personally collected from the Mantango Formation. Now, our house is full of fossils and rocks, <laughs> but from other periods, too. But we just brought the ones tonight from the Mantango for you to look at. So, uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I, I hope you'll take some time to look at them before you leave. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you about it if you have any more questions about this. This is our, our one of our favorite collecting areas in this area because it's easily accessible and there's a wide variety of fossils you can find and uh usually a lot of them when you get into the formation you get into the reef part you're going to find a lot of things yes a masonry chisel will work that'll work fine cold chisel yeah that's what they yeah that's what it's called <laughs>
cold chisel. Okay? Well, I hope the I I hope you didn't groan too much over the jokes I told. I'm sorry. You didn't have to, but anyway. Yes. Well, Laurie and I have been to Centralia. As far as that's the only one we know of, because we know St. Clair is another issue. Uh, is very restricted there. But we go, we've done well at Centralia. That's a good fern site. Okay, and that's would be over to our, that's in Columbia County, okay, to the east of where I showed you uh, on the map on the Pennsylvania map. That's a very accessible site for anybody. You will find fern fossils there if you go to Centralia. Okay. And it's a big pit. Okay. But that's Pennsylvania period. That's a different formation, of course. That's the Llewellyn formation. Okay. And we've hunted there as well. So and the night one the other nice thing about the Devonian, it also, if you look back, I'll see if I can go back there real quick. Where was that map of Pennsylvania? I'll get to it. They're right here. Um, and the, if you notice, what's also at, right at the contact point with the, with the Amantango formation, right here it is in the, in the lavender, you see this purple, dark purple area? That's the Silurian. There's fossils in those rock outcrops as well, just a different time period, which is not quite as old as Devonian. And then you have over here Mississippian. Now, I haven't found any Mississippian outcrops yet, but I'm still looking. Uh, uh, but you also have uh, uh, Ordovician, Ordovician there too. There's some sites along here. So look, here's the area where you find the... Uh, fern fossils over here, okay, in Pennsylvania. But see, if you did a little exploration anywhere around here, you're bound to find some fossils from a variety of different uh, geological areas, okay? Sometimes we found, you know, I will say, you know, on the, the ones on the end, the far right on the end of the table, Laurie and I were coming back from visiting my aunt up in John, near in Cambria County. Uh, up here near Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and we came back through Bedford County to get home. And I saw a road cut. I saw some shale on the side of the road, and I pulled off. I, I, uh, now there wasn't much room to get off the road. I probably caused a hazard on the road. I put the four ways on, and I jumped out and I looked over there, and I immediately saw these strange-looking things that turned out to be marine worm burrows. Okay. There were no brachiopods because that's what I was looking for to see if that's what I could find. She stayed in the car. She was afraid to get out there because she thought we were going to get hit, you know, on the road. But I went out, checked it out for about 10 minutes. In 10 minutes' times, I found those slabs that had, you could see the marine worm castings where they burrowed through the, you know, through the mud, which was something I'd never found before. I had to go to the fossil forum to get someone to identify those things. I didn't know what they were. And so, but, uh, that was kind of cool, just checking out road, a random road cut along the side of the road. I found out that was Mantango 2, somewhere down here in Bedford County, okay? It's right here, right in this area. So checking them out is can be valuable. Yes. Oh, yes. The bell, that's in, yeah, that's in Lehigh, I think that's in Lehigh County, isn't it? Yeah, Lehighton, so I think it's Lehigh County. And that would be, wait a minute, that would be over here. Okay? Right on this contact line, right in this area, right in here. Okay? So you see, if you go to Beltsville, we're kind of going up this way, a little further east to the Beltsville. Yeah, that site from here is about a two hour and two hour and 45 minute drive from here, you know, from Perry Hall. Okay, if you live in this area. And I always go this way and up or that way. Okay. That's a good question though, but that's that's still Mantango. You still get some of that right up in here. <laughs> well that there yeah, if anybody has some insight over there, we've got one over there that was found at the Rio site that's Jet Burns. I remember I found that. I was by myself that day. Laurie wasn't with me. Is when we were dating, but I, when I found it, 
I pulled it out of the side of that road cut there by that Del Rey road cut I was telling you about. And uh, I didn't know what it was. And somebody pulled up alongside the road who claimed, he claimed, I'm not sure if he really was, claimed he belonged to the West Virginia, uh, what's that, that paleontological museum they got out there in what, far West Virginia. He wanted to, he claimed it was a fossil fish. I didn't buy. I don't. I didn't buy it. He wanted to take my fossil and put it in his museum. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I didn't know this guy, man. But anyway, he was. Uh, that was the first ID of it. So he thought it was a fish, like a placoderm. Okay, uh, which it might be. We had another uh, when we were up in New York. We showed it a picture of it to who was that guy? A paleontologist up in New York. Uh, I forget his name. Anyway, he uh, he thought it was a trilobite, some piece of a trilobite, because of those bumps on the back of it. Yeah, like, you know, I said, that makes sense. But then somebody else said, no, it's just some kind of arthropod. Okay. Nobody can, and I put it on fossil form, no, the Devonian website. Nobody can identify what it is. But if you know the answer, you win the prize, whatever it is. Okay. <laughs> you know? We don't know what it is, but you can, you'll see it over there. It's a weird-looking thing. It's about this big. It came right out of the side of that formation, okay, along with all the other gastropods. Yeah, I don't either. I also got another one in that nearby, down near Baker. You'll notice it's another one that went unidentified for a long time. That's that one that looks like a pine cone sticking up, but it's not. It's a, it's, it was bunch, with a bunch of other brachiopods. Somebody on the fossil form identified, so I put a question mark after it, and it looked like, uh, I can't even pronounce the name, it was a, a glass sponge. Because look, it doesn't, have, it doesn't have segments going across, the lines go up and down. That came right out of that formation right there. You'll see it down near Baker, and it's about this long. So you'll see it, take a look at that one, see if you've seen anything like it. So somebody said it was a glass sponge, which I'd never found one of those either. So first and only. Yes, you'll find a lot of corals, like the, especially. Now, the thing about the corals there, uh, some of them, you'll need your you'll need your chisel there, or well, you gotta you gotta bat, pound them out because they're in some of the harder gray rock. But some of the shales, some of the shales up near the parking area, are very good. Laurie got in; she she kind of hung out there as I was going up and down the spillway uh, with our little group, and. Uh, I, I was finding all these horn corals down there, and she was finding lots of brachiopods, and she even found a, a nice trilobite up there in the shales. So you got several different kinds of rocks there. They were more of a tannish color shale up there near the parking lot. She went down, I went down there, and I could see some beautiful horn corals in the rock. Just couldn't get them out. They were, they were embedded in these big slab boulders. But there are others you could get out. If some of them weathered out, you could get them out. You just got to look for them. And, Start chipping, chipping away. Now, there's a lot of bryozoans, that net-like Fenestella stuff, a lot of that. There are some, there are some trilobites in there. Uh, I found a couple bat, uh, tail sections, a couple tail sections, and uh, Laurie found a nice one. And some bracts. But horn corals and bryozoans are especially predominant. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's no shade there. We had to, we had gone there with our little group. Uh, I assume they have a gate there. You have to get permission from the Army Corps of Engineer. Uh, and, and Matthew got secured that permit. I got a permit too. But since we went on a Saturday, no one was there at the office. So we had to hike it. We got we were able to get through the gate, but we, we weren't allowed to drive it. So we went all the way around, which was not so bad going. But coming back with our buckets full of fossils, it was it took us an hour to get back up to the parking lot. But I think Matthew's arranged on it, because that's on a Friday, I think. I think Matthew's arranged for us to be there where you can park right next to the outcrop. Yep, right on the spillway, which is, that's a bonus. Because you will find fossils there. There's a lot of fossils to find. You know, it's just, it's a matter of picking and choosing which ones you want to keep, okay? So you will see lots of fossils. 
Anybody else? Well, once again, thanks. Thanks for listening to me. I hope I didn't bore you. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. And like I said, take a take a look over at the table before you leave. Okay. Okay. Huh? Oh, I've been to Wyoming. And yeah. She said it was, you know, one of those great programs. Exactly. Yeah.